My name is Margot Landman. I am Senior Director for Education Programs at the National Committee. And can't be happier that all of you have decided to take time this evening to join us for what I am sure is going to be a very interesting and thought-provoking discussion. We will have a conversation among the three of us for a little while, and then we will open it up to questions and comments from the audience. If we do have people in the overflow rooms, I don't know if we do, and you have questions, come on over and we will accommodate your questions as well. Lenora, congratulations yes. on your book. Thank you. The official publication date, that's this book, is tomorrow. So we are absolutely thrilled <laughs> that you are here to talk with us. Why don't you tell us about how the book came to be? Sure. So, you know, if you look at China, the narrative is usually very polarizing. And in education, it's either the world's best students or it's rote learning robots, you know, no creativity. And I wanted to sort of deconstruct this narrative. And in 2010, I happened to move to Shanghai with my family. And that year in education, Shanghai, the spotlight was on Shanghai because of this test called PISA. Shanghai kids were number one in the world in math, reading, and science. And of course, Americans sort of fell somewhere in the middle of the pack. And people were very upset about this. Um, just down the street was one of the best state-run public schools in all of Shanghai. And we had a little boy, and he needed a school. So we enrolled him. And uh, through this sort of narrative, I also happen to be a journalist. So through this sort of parenting narrative, and also my skills as a journalist, I, I knew I had um, an opportunity to sort of pull back the curtain on some of these questions. Gish, what's the genesis of your book, and what do avocado pits have to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, like Lenora, I'm very interested in education. And, um, you know, I heard a story a couple of years ago. Um, this story involved um, Milton Academy, which some of you may know. It's a very prestigious New England um, prep school. And what happened was that a girl had applied to Milton. Um, she had great um, TOEFL scores, she had great essays, um, they did a Skype interview with her, she did a great interview, and um, they admitted her, they're very excited, and then, you know, as they went to pick her up from the airport, and right away they realized that something was a little bit off, and, um, you know, as the semester went on, it became clear that the girl who had come was not the girl who had done the Skype interview, but her sister. And you know, I was told this story by um, a head of, an, of another independent school that was since corroborated by Milton. And you know, they just told the story just like you know, all the heads of schools are talking about it. Just like, it, this is just so strange. But when I heard that story, I thought, this is not so strange, actually. I, this is, in, in Asia, this business of substituting one person for another, uh, this very kind of close teamwork, um, is actually very common. And um, so I recognize this pattern. And, but as I talked more to the educators, I could see that there were many things about this new cohort of Chinese students that were just completely baffling um, to, um, to the educators here. Um, and also, you know, I spent a lot of time in China. I could see that in China, the reverse was also true. You know, I was teaching at um, NYU Shanghai, where their whole mission is to bring US education to China. And I could see there's just a way in which there are a lot of things about their Chinese students that, you know what I mean, that they didn't get and that the Chinese students the Ch in China didn't get about the school. And I just thought, you know what, I actually understand both sides of this. And um, there is a book where I can explain it, you know, because there's a lot of deep research, right? And know? avocado. And pits. avocado. Pits. Well, and what I, was, what I realized that the, the piece of information that they were missing was that the South that dominates in the East and the South that dominates in the West are very different. You know, the, in the West, we have a self that is like an avocado. We imagine that we have a big pit in the center of us, a sacred pit, I will say. You know, this is the thing that we call ourself. We feel that this is our identity. You know, the whole purpose of U.S. education is to understand the nature of this identity, to identify its strengths and weaknesses, to develop it, to develop its voice. 
and then we're very, we're very much committed to making sure that it has free expression, that it can move freely, and this is the model that we have. Um, but actually, research has, has established that you know, in the rest of the world, and I do mean like most of the rest of the world, meaning Asia, Africa, South America, Central and Eastern Europe, a lot of places in Western Europe, a lot of places in the United States, and even in the United States itself, until fairly recently, a different self actually dominates, and that's a self that's much more like a, you know, like a, um, like a Gumby. <laughs> um, and it's, 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 a, it's a flexi self, a self that, it, that is just as full of agency as the, as the avocado pit self. I mean, it is fully capable of traveling abroad, or, you know what I mean, opening restaurants, doing all these things that we think of. You know, it, it's not that it's, um, I think when we use that collectivistic, we imagine that, that, that somehow this is a self that only, you know, that can't take any initiative. And that's completely wrong. You know, I mean, anybody goes to Asia, you know, there's plenty of initiative, there's plenty of entrepreneurship. But what's different is the meaning of it. In other words, where, where is it coming from? So when they sort of say, oh my God, like everything, they, they don't care about branding. Or when it comes to law firms, you know, and you know, here you have Sydney, you know, Sydney, Austin, there's a Sydney and there's an Austin, you know? In China, you know, you have a, you have a, you have a law firm, it's Thompson Rose. There's no Thompson and there's no Rose, <laughs> you know? Because that whole idea, you know, the idea is, you know, our law firms, you know, there's an idea, there's kind of an integrity involved. There are actual people there. And so the, the law firms, you know, are kind of are emanations of these people and their <coughs> avocado pits, you know? Whereas the Chinese law firms, they don't have this idea at all. You know, like, what do you, what do you think is a good name? Oh, you think they'll like Thompson Rose? Okay, let's use that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a completely different view. So you can sort of see it's much more geared to, well, what will work? You know? Oh, well, that'll work. We'll do that. Hmm. As I think about Chinese education, which I have spent a lot of time doing, and about American education, I find myself troubled by the sweeping generalizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is not one education system here. There is not one education system there. The child of a migrant worker in Shanghai is not getting the same education as the kid at the Song Ling school. Right, right. Um, obviously, we have an hour. We have to make some generalizations. But it's something to keep in mind that there are a lot of differences. You've gotten a lot of attention for this book, Lenora, which is great. But I wonder if some of the commentary has gotten things a bit wrong, oh. suggesting that you say <laughs> We're gonna wade into that. Chinese education is all good, Western education, American education is all bad. Using yourself as an example, you obviously did pretty well as a product of Houston Public Schools. You went to Stanford, which is not known for taking slouches. Um, what is it that you see that's positive about the Chinese education system that you've seen through your son's experience and through the reporting that you've done for this book? Sure. Um First, let me go back to the first week of my son's uh, experience in school. And, you know, as a mother concerned about individual choice, I want him to eat eggs. I want what's good for him, but I don't want to force him to do something. So he goes off to school the first week, and the teacher immediately shoves eggs in his mouth and pretty much holds his mouth shut until he swallows. So this offends pretty much every sensibility in my body, and I march off to school and I confront her. I say, in America, you know, <laughs> in America, we incent our children to choose. We explain the benefits of egg eating, and we trust them with the decision. We don't use force. And she says, does it work? And I say, <laughs> sometimes yes and sometimes not. And then later she challenges, she says, don't ever challenge my authority in front of a child again. So I immediately realized that I'd been for much more than I bargained for. Um, so when Gish is talking about sort of individual, you know, where are the motivations coming from in China is very much sort of a group orientation. You know, she was very concerned that I was making waves that would detract from, you know, the group progress in the classroom. And she had a very um, central idea of what her authority was supposed to look like. Um, so when Gish talks about internal, um, a lot of my work is about external um, drivers of behavior. And can I just show a quick slide? I just want to show them the stakes of the education system. Is, how do I go? 
it is. Okay. So just very quickly, you know, education in China is essentially a sorting mechanism. Now, you, you can say this actually applies in Shanghai, much more so in the countryside, but there's a lot of anxiety around education. If you think about 18 million babies born every year, at every level of the ladder, there's an entrance exam. And at that high school entrance exam, you lose something like 8 million kids, right? You cannot go on to regular high school. At the college entrance exam, you lose another few million. You know, and if you're talking about the very top tier that everyone aspires to, you're really only call, you know, talking about a couple hundred thousand children. So this is, this is high stakes, right? And that drives behavior. So I think it's really important to understand this external force. If you actually, I love talking to Chinese parents in Shanghai. Um, if you say, how's Cindy doing? It, you know, I'm expecting them to say, oh, she loves tennis. You know, we go to museums on weekends. But it's usually something like this. Out of 47 students in her class, she's 8 in math, 9th in Chinese, and 27th in physics. You know, everything is really about that score and that ranking in relation to the group. Um, so I, I just think that's really important to understand. Now, there's good and bad. There's good and bad. And one of the good things um, that I've discovered in our experience there is that the Chinese have a cultural term. It's called chiku, or eating bitter. And that, that translates into hard work in the classroom. The studies show that there's a connection between hard work and sort of achievement. And in the US, and I've gotten a lot of uh, flack for this essay that I wrote, um, we get it right in sports, right? We're OK with pushing Johnny because we believe he'll get faster if he just trains harder. But when you translate that into the classroom, it doesn't quite work because we're scared he's going to feel bad at, about himself. We don't really believe that in that connection between hard work and achievement, we're more likely to believe in talent. And so I feel like that is one cultural difference that I've learned um, in my research. There's a few more, but I'll stop there. Would you say that there are some strengths to the American education system that you don't see? Absolutely. In the yeah. So just a quick, this slide. Ooh, these are Geshe slides. But you know, okay. So there's a lot of order to this classroom, which is great, right? I mean, good and bad. You have these kids packed in very tightly, and this teacher has decided that three rows with knees touching the chairs in front is order. But I see hope, because if you look, there's a lot of individual expressions. Some kids are paying attention. Some kids aren't. There's laughter. There's joy. Now, you stay in the system for too long. Now, I went into the rural countryside. And these kids are you know, pre-teenagers. And I gave them a bunch of art materials. And I said, I want you to illustrate your dream. What is your dream? So out of 50 kids, I got something like 48 houses, right? Everybody had sort of the same idea. Two were really into world peace, you know, which is great, but a lot of houses. <laughs> but this photo, I, I think Gish will like this photo because, you know, this wouldn't happen in an American classroom. These two kids just decided, I'm going to do everything exactly the same down to the cut and the color of the sun, right? And so that, is, that orientation is, is, I think, captured very well in, in this particular photo. But as far as what Americans do, right, just very quickly, we're so good at talking to our kids, you know, not only asking them what they're interested in, but what do you think about it? And on an, a daily basis, you know, in the classroom, teachers are doing it. And also at home, we're challenging our kids to think. And unfortunately, most Chinese children, they have a teacher knows best classroom, and they come home, and they have a parent knows best home environment. And so they're not very practiced at making decisions for themselves. You know, I think it's so interesting because I think that, you know, as one thing I think we really agree on is that is, is not that, I, well, maybe this is wrong. But it's, the question is really not kind of like, is China better or is America better? Yeah. Because, you know, China is good for China. It's a poor country. It's true. You know what I mean? You may, we may not like that ladder, but that is a poor country with very few resources. You know, they don't have, they just don't have the resources to educate the numbers of people that we do here. Um, on the other hand, you know, what works in China does not work here. Do you know what I mean? And I think a kind of a very interesting question, at least to me, is how, what can we do to improve our own system? Like, what little bits can we learn, yeah, right? Yeah, there's you know, a kind huge of Because there's a middle, right there now. is a middle ground. And can we stop simply rejecting their system because it's conformist? Yeah. Because I will say that, you know, and, you know I mean, I'm a, I'm a writer. I am not, like, anti-creativity, you know? And yet what I do know is that, you know, if, if I had a child who was interested in art, I want them to learn to do perspective, you know? And the answer is, you know, you may have the genius child who can invent, you know, can figure out the worlds of perspective, him or herself. But most children cannot figure out the, of, the rules of perspective, him or herself. And most of them learn 
this way by imitating someone else or by being taught how to do that. Um, I think in the US system, to learn to kind of, to, you know, to go past that is a great thing. But I have to say that in my own experience, I don't know very many great artists who didn't also learn to do perspective. And I think that there's this way in which we think, oh, it's all going to come out of the avocado pit. And if, if you tell them, well, that's wrong, you know, those terrible words, that's wrong, which they see all the time in China, right? Yeah. It's like, that's just wrong. But we're afraid that, oh, the avocado pit will kind of shrivel up and it won't want to come out, you know? <laughs> um, but um, I would have to say that, you know, if, if we're talking about creativity, and of course I know many writers and so on, um, the people who have a lot to say are not are, are completely <laughs> undaunted by being told the rules, the rules of perspective, or for that matter, the rules of storytelling. You know, I mean, the whole idea that there is, you know, a storytelling, um, you know, that there is a fry tag triangle that you must learn to do this if you're going to go on to be a fiction writer. It's necessary but not sufficient, right? I mean, if you you're learning to do this is not going to make you is not going to make you a great writer. And that, but then you sit down with you know early Faulkner, early everybody, and you discover that actually they could all do it, you know. And I think that there's there's nothing about learning to do those things that impedes creativity, in my view. Mm. You were going to say something. Um, I just you know this this narrative about Chinese not being creative. Yes, I mean if you look at that photo these kids didn't really feel the need to sort of do something different from each other. And, and in the West, we so value individualism. Like, and often it's sort of the loudest person that we think as the leader. You know? And in China, it, it's very different. And I also have, just from talking to entrepreneurs and seeing what works in China, there's a different driver of creativity that we sort of forget about, which is authoritarianism. And if you have that top-down teacher who says, I don't want to hear your opinion. You find little ways to get around her. Now, um, you see this in really young kids. Like in, they learn from a very un, young age. If there's only certain times you can get water, this is, this is terrible. But this is a reality of the Chinese classroom. There's 50 kids, right? There's only certain times you can get water. You find creative ways. And there's, um, if you're branded a coffer, you can go get water anytime you want. You know. And so you see kids <laughs> with the nurse check-in in the beginning. The, they open their mouth and they go. <clears throat> And then they get the yellow card, and they can go get water whenever they want. You know, so there are little ways. Um, one character in my book, this, there are antiquated laws that basically require you. Imagine if you had to take the SAT in your place of birth. That means I'd have to go back to Philadelphia and take the SAT there. Well, in China, there are hukou laws that basically require you to go back. So uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways that people devise to to work around the system. And I I feel like that authoritarianism, which is so. Um, it feels so wrong. It actually drives behavior in China. Yeah, I must also say that in a general kind of way, because there are so many barriers, you know, not everybody has to be Steve Jobs, and it kind of lets people off the hook a little bit. Right. Now right. here, I tell you, you know, kind of, if you, you know, if you're talking about kind of the Harvard Stanford level, you know, I mean, what you're supposed to do, I mean, it's just so extraordinary. You need to be extraordinary, capital E. And, and that is a lot of pressure. You know, so when you look at when people have creative block, in a funny kind of way, if all those impediments, then you don't have creative block. Because if you don't do something great, it wasn't your fault. Whereas there are all these people, it's kind of like, they know, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And honestly, they kind of just drive themselves into a little hole in the ground, asking a question that maybe if they just did, you know, they had all, it's just like tennis. It was just like kind of, you just got to get the ball over the net. If they were focused on getting the ball over the net, they might actually be better off. You know, they might be happier and more creative. I'd like to go back for a moment to the girl at the baggage claim. I think most Americans would say, or many Americans would say, that that's an example of corruption. That here, the American school thought it was getting girl A, mm -hmm. but girl B was taking the test and doing the Skype interview and not showing up at Logan. You have a description that sort of made my hair stand on end with the purchase of coach bags. Yeah. Um, talk about those episodes and what they mean about our society and Chinese society. And either one of you can go first. Well, you know, I will say just in generally, you know, these test focused, you know, a test focused system of any kind tends to produce 
um, corruption. For example, here, very famously, once we had no child left behind, we had that huge scandal with the Atlanta's teachers. I don't know if you remember this, mm -hmm. yeah. but you know, I mean, it's just like you know, the whole district is cheating. I think eleven teachers ended up in jail. And, yeah, yeah, and you know, so we have cheating. You know, once you kind of you have a high stakes test like that, um, people will cheat, and so the, I think that that's everywhere. Uh, that said. You know, when you have a whole nation with this high stakes system, I mean, you know, the corruption is everywhere, and um, and it is a huge problem. Um, I will also, I have to say, you know, because I, you know, I there is a way in which here we're so focused on the problems that we tend to conflate that very problematic, the cheating and so on, with this self itself. And I think that's some place where I feel like these things need to be a little disaggregated. Because um, anyone who's been in China will know just as many stories of just unbelievable honesty. You know, I mean, I, I lost, um, I dropped my wallet in one of these water, um, water markets, you know, so this is like, it's just like 10,000 people, you know, I mean, it's just literally there are 10,000 people. I dropped my wallet, which is a kind of shiny, very US looking wallet. In, you know, in front of this food stall, it had like $3,000 US in it, as well as my US passport. Mm. I mean, and you know, so any, and anybody picking that up would know this is a US wallet. I, I was panicked when I realized I dropped it. You know what? A guy was standing there, they were looking for me. I got it back, I got, I, it was completely untouched, and there were like a thousand people around. I mean, in other words, it, the, the self goes both it's ways. Right. It goes both ways. I mean, I can tell, and that's this one of, you know, I, I asked a, a, a migrant worker, I mean, in the end, it was a long story of how I had to hire, hire this migrant worker to come clean my apartment out before I left Shanghai. And, you know, I, you know, I was perfect. I could see that she had no money, you know, and I wanted to pay her like much more, you know, I mean, I had hired, you know, it was something like 16 renminbi an hour or something, you know, and I just, I just wanted to, you know, look, I'm leaving the country here, just take the rest of my renminbi. She was there for three hours, would not take one renminbi more than she was supposed to. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of this stuff, you know, so it's really not like this is like a nation of cheaters. That said, the education system especially, I think, is just full of corruption because of the stakes. Uh, yeah, and also um, there's, so <laughs> um, you have money now. There's money in China, especially in Shanghai and Beijing. And there's a hierarchy. I learned that coach was no longer passe. Coach was passe as of 2012. Um, <laughs> then it became sort of, you know, Tory Burch was really, you know, Prada, you know, some, and now it's sort of like, you know, Arts, you know, they want something that nobody can get, and now they don't want a logo on the bag. And, you know, this, this mixture of sort of consumer culture and, and greed and high stakes in the education system. But I have a, a sort of a kinder way of looking at it. Now, anyone who has interacted with, the Chinese, with any Chinese in your life, you know that gifting is really important for the relationships in your life. There are academic papers written about how you hand it over. Is it a higher status person or a lower status person? What's the size of the gift? But here is what I think is a little bit different in Chinese culture. There's this expectation of reciprocity. I feel like in America, it's, it's, you, you show a token of appreciation, you give a gift. But in China, you don't want to accept something if you don't want to owe that person something in return. And I, I've learned this the hard way. Trust me, I've made many blunders. Um, but in, in the Chinese system, a teacher who takes a gift, then all of a sudden you start seeing, OK, well, why is that kid in the front row and my kid's in the back? You know, in, in the performance lineups, you know, why is my kid in the back? And did this kid really learn, earn the A, or is it something else? Was it the Louis Vuitton? You know, and this is a problem in Shanghai. And actually, in rural areas, it's not Louis Vuitton. It's more um, tutoring for outside services, you know, paying your teacher for time outside of class. And it is that combination of stakes and the sort of gifting culture and, you know, greed. So well, let me just show you. I'm going to show a slide as well. Um, um, wait, this is. That was my, our two selves. <laughs> and also I want to show this thing. See, this is a pit self. And so as you can sort of see, you know, this is the self that we recognize from, you know, most of our literature. And it has a very strong boundary around the individual. Um, and this is the flaxy self. And what you can see is that there is a, you know, there's still a boundary between, you know, the individual and their intimate others. But it's a permeable, a permeable boundary, right? And the, the really strong boundary actually is between the in-group and the out-group. And the reason this, this, how this connects to your story, Lenora, is that when you give a gift, 
what you are doing is you are moving someone, you know, you are moving someone from this to this. Do you know what I'm saying? And so, and therefore, all Ooh, in a way. that's perfect. I like that. <laughs> but that's what's happening, yeah, right? That's right. And that's, that's where the reciprocity is coming from. You know, what you are really saying is now we have a relationship. And it, it goes back. And now we're much closer. And so that's why I think that, you know, we look at, in America, this is always corruption. But in China, sometimes it's corruption. Because it's, you're moving it's... closer to each other for a reason. It's instrumental. Mm -hmm. But frequently, it's not. You know, frequently it's just a way of establishing a, a relationship, mm -hmm. and That's true. Um, and also, you know, like I say, in the instrumentality part of it can be complicated. You know, it's like, it's like somebody once said to me, he said, you know, um, I feel more comfortable giving a, when somebody gives me a bribe because then I, it's kind of we're, we're all you understand. Kind of in this together. <laughs> so I, so I, you know, it's like kind of like if they if they come to get us, they're gonna have we're all gonna go down together. You know, so it's kind of it's kind of so the bribe. It's, we think the bribe itself is very important. You know, the, you know the, the the bag or whatever, but that isn't necessarily what's important. What's important is now we are brothers. All right, so you know, a very quick sisters. story. We have a friend who's a very famous painter in China, and he decided to paint my son, and this was sort of a big deal. You know, I spent a lot of time doing it. Now we have this painting that's kind of probably worth quite a bit of money. I thought, oh, that's really nice. And then three years later, it turns out his brother has this anti-gravity machine, and my husband, my husband reports for NPR, and he wanted my husband to do a story on this anti-gravity machine that really has been going nowhere for, for 10 years. You know, so now we realize if there's something coming our way, you have to sort of question you know, where this is coming from. But you know, it's not necessarily corruption. It's just a way of showing appreciation and giving us something. But yes, at some point, it's, it's part of taking care of people in your group. So, did you want to show the rest of your slides before we open it up? No, we can you? go ahead. I mean, I was going to talk about the nature of art, but it's all right. Okay. <laughs> That's a big topic. We will open up to questions and comments. Please give your name and affiliation. Larry? Thank you. Uh, Larry Bridwell, Pace University. I have a lot of students from uh, China in the, the graduate classes. But one of the, the interesting issues for me, and I come from California and UCLA and Cal Berkeley, half of the incoming freshmen are of Asian background. And I've been following a little bit the lawsuits that are underway at Harvard and Princeton, and I think Columbia, but I'm not sure, on the basis that Asians say that if they get an SAT score of 740, they call it an Asian fail because they're not going to be able to be competitive with Caucasians and other ethnic groups. And I'd be interested in your opinion of those dynamics. This is a very loaded question. But, <laughs> but I, I, I will say that I think that um, the contention that kind of Asian Americans are not seen as a that, they're, that there's no kind of um, that uh, there isn't a quota, you know, there isn't a, a ceiling, um, is clearly wrong. Clearly, there is a ceiling because you look at the percentages of the class every year, and it's so even. There's a ceiling. Um, the question of whether that means that the Asian Americans don't have to then compete against each other. Clearly, the Asian Americans have to compete against each other. Um, the, the contention that therefore, you know, that this is somehow related to affirmative action and that, you know, this is bad and, you know what I mean, and if we strike this down, we should also strike down affirmative action, I think is also highly um, erroneous. I mean, I think that, that um, to set a floor for certain groups in America, I mean, a, a, a school like Harvard is in the, in the business of producing leaders for the whole nation and the whole world. Um, there has to be diversity. I mean, I think for anybody to argue that diversity is not important and it's just a matter of how well you do in academics is just completely wrong. I mean, on what basis, what argument could you possibly make, you know, uh, where it's okay for certain groups to be overrepresented but not others? Uh, it's, it's, it's a very complicated question. I'm just glad that I am not on the admissions committee at Harvard. <laughs> for a number of reasons. No, I'll, I'll, yeah, stay out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. 
Hi, I'm Maria Costa. I work for the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, I was wondering if, if either of you had um, noticed a, a difference in the degree of interest and awareness um, to what the other country is doing education-wise um, in China and the United States. So the Chinese, if you look at where they're insecure, it's education. You know, if you look at the president of China, Xi Jinping, he doesn't seem really insecure about anything. But in education, they're very insecure. They're sending teachers over you know, to you, the UK, to the Netherlands, to the US, Australia, to learn. And they're not, you know, not surprisingly, they're not really looking at how we're teaching math. They're looking at how we get students interested in learning, how they love what they're doing in the classroom, and they're bringing some of that back. So um, what I do worry about is it's not really coming the other way. There's a lot of resistance to, you know, American education, maybe learning from other cultures. And I think in the policy circles, they're thinking and talking about it. But when you try to filter some of that down, uh, it feels really uncomfortable, you know, to have that discussion. So well, it's, it's translated into a different language here. In other words, like, you know, a lot of the discussion about grit, essentially, when they're talking about, you know, what our students need to do is they need to learn to be grittier, i.e., they need to just persevere. Uh, you know, regardless of whether they think they can, they can, um, they're getting good feedback that reflects well in their avocado fit or not, right? Um, and so, but but you cannot say that that idea comes from Asia, you know, even though it, sure. clearly, it, clearly, it clearly does. But there's, you know, there's, you know, there's a way in which, you know, if you ask me why I wrote my book, I mean, of course, I'm very interested in U.S. China things, but I'm also interested in bringing to our own attention, just you know that our own individualism is a kind of religion. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it is a, you, you cannot say anything which is anti-individualism without your head coming off. And, um, and, I, and I, I just wonder how healthy that is. You know, I mean, I just think that, like I say, um, we ourselves, we're not always as individualistic. And the question is, is it does it work for us? And are we so, when it comes to education, are we so busy protecting the student's self-esteem that we can't get them to sit there a little longer. Right. I mean, there were tests where you know they you know they they gave a test that where where there's no answer to the you know to the to the questions, to um, to these kids in Japan, these kids sat and stuck with those with those problems, you know indefinitely. I mean, they had to finally say, okay, you can quit now. Actually, there's no answer. You know, <laughs> well, the American kids though, I mean, and that that has its own problems probably. But they're, you know, they're definitely, they have the perseverance thing down. The U.S. kids, on the other hand, 30 seconds, and they gave up. Well, I don't know what the answer is. And the answer is, you know, in any, in any field, I don't think there is, any, there is any field where people have not achieved through tremendous levels of perseverance. So, you know, so the degree to which our individualism has led to this kind of hyper-protection of our avocado pits has led to an inability to persevere, it's quite a problem. And that's basically what I said in my Wall Street Journal Saturday essay a couple of weeks weekends ago, where you have to think about where is this emphasis that maybe the, on the individual going a little bit too far, where teachers are, sp are spending a lot of time attending to individual needs that maybe aren't necessary. I'm talking about the ones that aren't necessary, that aren't, you know, life preserving, you know, the ones that don't detract that, that don't have to do with learning. We should have a thought about this. You know, what are we, what are we doing in the classroom? Um, and, and, and I think that's one of the lessons. Yeah, and just serve our students if they're, you know that's I mean? right. if they can't, if they can't master basic math. That's right. Do you know what I mean? I mean, who, who was served by that? To me, I there mean, are you, research studies you that show. Their, you protect yeah. their self-esteem, but you have not served that student. And it's so hard to get that connection. If you actually look at all the research studies, primary school math skills actually correlate to earnings, you know, a couple decades later. And it's, that's something that just sounds kind of icky, you know, but, but it's true. You know, if you look at the research, that's what it shows. Back there. Hello, Petros Bercelis. Um, Stanford alum, I guess, is how I got the invite for today. So, um, so I'm actually originally from Greece, and so I was educated in Greece, then educated in the U.S. My girlfriend is from Hong Kong, so, you know, some of the stuff you guys are talking about actually kind of, um, especially the Chinese part of, of, of the world, kind of resonates more with my kind of Greek um, background, but then, you know, because I was educated here, I, you know, I also feel close to that system. So what I've observed throughout my, you know, my 
my own kind of journey was like, you know, those differences. And what you said about corruption and this kind of inner cir circle concept really resonated. So one thing I would like to ask you is to what extent do you think that, you know, certain things that people do to do good by their, you know, inner circle or what, you know, that concept in, in Asia or in China and in this particular case, you actually, or, or people still have here in, in, in America, but it's just called differently. And I'll give you an example, right? So in, you know, in China, you would have, um, you know, a couple of, you know, the gifts you mentioned, you know, helping out someone in your inner circle, and you call that potentially corruption, right? You come here, you go to a networking event, you know, you, you know, you go to the same school, you help, you help out someone from your school, you call that networking. So, you know, it would just be interesting to, you know, kind of hear your, your thoughts on that. First, can I, because we're taping, I realize I should say this disclaimer. I talked about accepting a painting, and actually this man was sort of a distant relative, so it was family. It wasn't like, you know, I didn't know what was <laughs> happening. And nothing ever came of the gift. It just sits in our living room, and I've never seen him again, okay? Just to be clear, um, for the record. <laughs> Um, do you want to take the first stab at that one? <laughs> well, no, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, in other words, I think that it's kind of human nature, if you will, to, you know, to make, you know, kind of these circles and, and um, it doesn't always have to be corrupt. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I, it really doesn't. Um, um, I will say that if there was something that I really fault about the Asian system, I think it's the very strong boundary um, between the in-group and the out-group. So, you know, I mean, the problem with that strong boundary is that, you know, is this, when you ask, well, why is this, why were people so kind in the water town and so honest? And then why are they, you know, why are they, you know, they just can't stick it enough to the Americans, you know? Well, why is that? And the answer is somebody beyond the bound, you know, the out group, they don't really regard as even really human. So there's a completely different you know, um, set of rules for inside and outside. That's true. And I think that for all that this system, there's a lot of wonderful things. You look at care for, for the elderly. You know, there are many things, just the sheer warmth of human relations. Um, there are many things about the system that are great. But then when you think about, you know, the way that the Japanese soldiers, you know, treated the, you know, even the Chinese and other people who are not Japanese during World War II, you just realize like, whoa, you know, that strong boundary is quite a problem. But it's changing very rapidly. If you look at philanthropy just in the eight years that I've been in Shanghai, there's so much giving now that I thought would never happen in 2010. I've been at, you know, charity balls where they've raised eight million U.S. dollars for poor rural kids, you know, education. And that was unthinkable eight years ago because the person giving doesn't really get anything out of it, really, except that while well, they sit at fancy tables and they get to, there's a face element to, you know, raising the paddle and they're doing a million and two million. So if you can tap that part of the culture, then you're going to get people to give. But, you know, it's changing because people are realizing that you have to give back. And, and that's why Shanghai, I was talking about this earlier with Gish, I feel like, you know, Evan Osnov says this where, especially in places like New York, Shanghai, Boston, LA, we're all, we all want the same things. You know, we're all now sort of competing on a more global marketplace, and, and our wants and needs really aren't that different when you're talking about this particular urban educated class. So it's just something to remember. Um, uh, because I was just on my way to Shanghai for a, a long work trip. Uh, my, my company is Taiwanese, uh, but we work primarily out of China now, um, and we do have an office here. Um, I also feel personally invested in, in kind of your, the story that you're telling. I spent some time in Taiwan at an elementary school. I sort of went through that, you know, that schooling system compared it to my experience in the U.S., um, one thing that I noticed when I was in China and Taiwan this summer, I was reading a lot of articles about the, I would call it maybe the mainland Taiwan creativity gap. Um, obviously, the two schooling systems are a little bit different. Also, one thing that I've noticed in Taiwan, especially over the past decade, is there seems to be kind of a, a creative renaissance going on. There's a lot of kind of more freewheeling, exploratory, creative design happening in Taiwan to the point where um, there are currently incentives being offered by a lot of Chinese cities, mainland Chinese cities, to entice Taiwanese youth to go to the mainland and get open companies or work. So I was, I've been thinking yep. about this a lot, and I'm looking forward to reading one of your books, but I was wondering if you are aware of these trends. 
sure. I mean, you know, China believes that Taiwan is is part of their country. So. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of political. There's a lot of political, char, you know, chargedness around this particular issue. Um, I think that, you know, there, the Communist Party really puts its heavy hand into the classroom, and I have a chapter about what kids are told in the classroom, and then what they learn outside is very different. You know, you can't tell a classroom of Chinese kids that the Japanese are devils because of a war they had a number of decades ago. Meanwhile, more Chinese are going to Japan and they're developing um, a, a taste for sashimi. You know, it's just what they're learning in the classroom very much conflicts with what they're seeing in the outside world. I think that China is comfortable encouraging tourism and money and exchange of ideas as long as you don't touch this sort of core party power. You know, anything is fine. And, and even encouraging kids to be creative all of that's fine, except in politics, ethics, and ideology, and religion. You know, there are like three or four areas where you just don't encourage critical thinking. A professor of education actually told this to me in China. So they're really opening their borders, except for anything that challenges that particular core. You know, I think that Taiwan is a great example, I think, of what you have when you have East and West when they come together. I mean, I think that one of the reasons that you're seeing this tremendous creativity there is that you know exactly the wall that we are trying to take down um, is is down in Taiwan, and and the results speak for themselves. Hi, my name is Kristen Green. I'm from IIE, and I'm a former dean of admissions from Yale and U.S. College, Singapore's first liberal arts college. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about admissions. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about macro level. It actually touches on. A professor that once told me, like, you talk all about this, like, Singapore, uh, China, you know, is, is rising up, and the Chinese are saying, we're just getting back to where we were. Mm -hmm. And so, my question for you is we talk about net export of Chinese goods to the US, but the conversation's really turning to net import, and we're seeing increase of students going to China for education, mostly from the region. And I'm kind of curious if you yourselves have seen this trend, and if so, why? In people going to China for for their undergraduate degrees. That's right. From from did you say from the U.S. Worldwide. Oh, worldwide. Most worldwide. Well, China's spending a lot of money on its university sector. You know, they, they take great pride. They, they've decided that they're going to build something to sort of rival the Ivy League. And there's a lot of money attached with that. You know, I've met a lot of academics coming through Shanghai, and they have grants that you just wouldn't imagine. They'd never get in the Netherlands or even, you know, here. Just money being thrown at them. And with that comes um, student interest, right? So it's, that's something that China is, is hoping to develop. You know, I think it's also just a matter of where they're placing their bets, you know? And um, I think that enough people have come to the United States to realize that actually this very thing that we're talking about, you know, the divide between the um, flexi self and the, and the pit self is such a difficult divide to, to navigate that a lot of them realize that actually they might be better off not trying to come to the United States and they'd be better off learning to deal with China, where yes, things are very difficult and yes, they have long standing, you know, kind of um, ethnic uh, um, animosities of various kinds, but fundamentally you're running on a system that is enough like what they know that they can succeed there. Hmm. Hi, my name is Cornelius Grove. I'm an independent scholar. I'm the author of The Drive to Learn, which discusses a whole bunch of these issues. It was published in June. As I was doing my research, and by the way, it's about the role of parents in, in good education. Um, one of the things I came across as I was doing uh, research for the book is a study that is actually still ongoing out of Stanford University. Uh, but the study, it's out of Stanford, but it's looking at Chinese universities. And the study, basically, it was reported in the New York Times at one point. The study wants to find out why, why students at Chinese universities don't seem to learn very much. So in order to establish a baseline for that study, they gave students from China, Russia, and the United States a test of uh, critical thinking. The test of critical thinking was an American test. It was actually developed by Educational Testing Service 
which I wasn't allowed to say in the book. I just said it came from a well-known American source. Um, the, uh, these were college freshmen in technical, uh, in technical uh, studies, and what we would call freshmen. I'm not sure that's what they call them. Now. And here's 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 the outcome. The students had who had the highest uh, of the three in critical thinking were the Chinese, second the Russians, lowest the Americans. Isn't this interesting, considering how much emphasis we put on critical thinking and, I guess, how much emphasis it doesn't get in China? Or maybe it does. That's interesting. But, you know, I have to say just, you know, it's just anecdotally. You know, I mean, I know a lot of people who, you know, they, they've come, they're from the very top of the Chinese system um, because I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And, you know, so they are postdocs at MIT, for example. Um, and people, you know, who've done, you know, I mean, they've done very, very, very well, and they, you know, and the answer is they tend to flounder. I mean, I have to say, I mean, I think some of them, I mean, look, there's some very, very good students, and I know also, I happen to know Harvard also is very interested in those students, and they want those top math students at, at Harvard, but it is true that some of the Chinese students do tend to flounder. I will say also that, you know, I taught at NYU Shanghai, so I had a lot of their, you know, those, the, the students who, who scored very high on the Gaokao. And honestly, their critical thinking was not as good as the, as, as the critical thinking of the U.S. students. I mean, that's just anecdotal, but it's, it, 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 was, very, it was noticeable. I mean, there, there are studies that have found the opposite, too. It's yeah. like, what are the parameters? How large is the sample size? Are you testing? What age of the children? It's, it's, it's kind of a hot button. Everyone's really looking at that right now, but you have to look a little bit deeper. Yeah. That said, but, you, but you're right that it's, it's complicated. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like, again, who is better at what? It's complicated. And another huge piece of it, of course, is that by the time these kids get to the Gaokao, their whole idea of college is college you just lay back and do nothing. I mean, you get through that Gaokao, you work really, really hard, now you're made. You do, I mean, I literally, literally University. they do yeah. nothing. Whereas the U.S. is the opposite. You know, you got through that gate, now it starts. You know, I mean, so, I mean, I think life at, at, um, at you know, Peking University and life at Harvard or Stanford they could not be more diametrically opposed. And the Chinese know this. That's why yeah. they're coming over here for the university system. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the best well, in the world. It, it used to be, and I think it still is, that it was said among international educators that the best education in the world was any country except the United States for elementary and secondary, then come here for university. That might be right. That might be right. John, did you have a question? Hi, I'm John Lowen. I'm from the National Committee. Uh, you've been talking about uh, largely these two separate groups of American students and Chinese students, but and, uh, this is perhaps particularly for Gish, who's working at a program that's roughly divided, and I'm thinking about U.S. universities where there's now an increasing number of Chinese in the classroom. So how does the, how does the professor accommodate both of these, you know, these it, uh, pits and flexi <laughs> students to accommodate both of these learning styles and is a program like NYU Shanghai or perhaps a different program that's like NYU Shanghai that's not uh, destined to succeed or fail? Ooh. <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I like to say that just it, it, NYU Shanghai is a success simply for the, for the very fact that they have managed to uh, establish themselves in Shanghai, and that the fact that they haven't been closed down. <laughs> I mean, no, really, because they, they really are practicing full freedom, freedom of speech, you know, on, you know, on the campus and within the university. The fact that they have been able to manage that politically, I, to me, is just mind-boggling, and I think we can only take our hats off to them. Um, that's, I think there's a lot of pressure, and I think, they're the, you know, the Chinese, Chinese government is looking very hard to see how those kids do. You know, so, you know, they are looking for those to, you know, do something really kind of amazing. And, you know, kind of 10 years from now, if, they, if those kids have not done that, I, I, I do fear for the future of the school. Um, in terms of, you know, luckily for me, you know, I was teaching creative writing, so kind of, you know, it's easy to adjust. You know, it's easy to adjust the expectations. Um, um, in, a, in a general kind of way, um, I do think that a certain sensitivity on the part of the teacher, especially when it comes to speaking in class, is really important. 
So, I mean, in other words, you cannot, you, I, I guess the most important thing is you cannot look at students who do not like to speak in class and just cast them as they're quiet, they're kind of unevolved, they are, do you know what I mean? They, they're any of those things. I mean, um, not, speaking, not speaking in class is very much associated with this um, flexi self. In fact, if we look at this um, diagram, and you can sort of see how like a lot of the early communication is, goes from, some, from person to person, it's not verbal. And their ideal, the ideal is still a kind of nonverbal, intuitive understanding. You know, that is kind of their base language, if you will. It's remains the, um, it remains the ideal, you know, like kind of everywhere, everywhere in Chinese literature, uh, unspoken communication, unspoken, you know what I mean? Um, in fact, if you have to, if you have to use words to talk to somebody else, that means that you are the other self, right? That means that there's a distance there. A distance that, frankly, if you're from the, from a flexi culture, you do not want to be there. Which means that it's formal, so they do not like that formality. Somebody who's coming from a system like that, and I will say also, um, there's studies that show that that um, the whole way of thinking is more global and pattern oriented, and because of that, it is harder for them. You know, if you are if you are more analytical, and you are actually thinking in a way that are like little packets, you're dividing things up. It's easier to get that into words, and um, so it's easier to think and talk at the same time than it is if you talk in this more pattern-oriented way. Um, there is no suggestion that either that one is more effective than the next. Actually, the, the uh, study that they did um, to show this difference was done at Stanford. So you know, so the you know the Asian Americans that they were looking at are obviously extremely you know able to function to problem solve. There's no difference in their actual ability to get to an answer. But the students are thinking in a different way. And one way is very conducive to sort of to um, being described. Uh, you know, it's easy for people to talk and, and describe their thinking. And it's very hard for the other people to um, describe their thinking. And, and um, see, I'm having trouble as I describe it. I myself am having trouble. Um, although if you ask them to recite the, in the ABCs, for example, the people with the flexi self can do that very easily. Whereas the people with the pit cells can't do that, you know? But they're both thinking. But the answer is, if you're, if you're that teacher, you cannot penalize, I think, people with a flexi self simply because we're really penalizing them because they come from another culture. You know, I mean, I think you can encourage them. Like, I always encouraged my students to speak up. You know, I tried to make it as easy for them as possible, and I tried to signal to them that I understood how hard it was. And I mean, I and I believe me, there are people, even very successful Asian Americans in in America, will describe how hard it, how hard this journey was. And people like, um, you know, Professor uh, G. Suk Gerson, who you see all the time in the New Yorker now, is a professor at the law school at Harvard. And you know, but she, you know, she also started out one of those people who could not speak in class. I started out as one of those people who could not speak, speak in class. The journey from that person to the person who can do this, is, it's, a, it's a long and difficult journey because you're talking about acquiring a different self, you know? So I think for the, for the teacher, I mean, I would always say to my students, you have to learn the same way you learned English. The answer is, it's a passport. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's just like, if you can learn English, just think how many doors will open to you. If you can't learn, it's just tough. And, that might be Western hegemony. I mean, it's just a matter of whether, whether, whether it's right or wrong. It is a fact of life. And if you want to work at any kind of international anything, you need to speak up in those meetings. So you, you have to learn this thing. But I think for teachers to judge the students too early, you know, to not really understand how hard it is for them, well, you know what I mean? This is where the teacher needs education, in my view. I wonder how much of what you just said is gendered as well. Yes. Those two examples were female. Yes. Well, it's but it's also true that you know the you know the head of um, one of the big monkey mucks at, at Facebook, who's a guy, ha ha describes the same process. Asian. Yes. Yes. And now he's like now he's a, you know he's a big monkey muck. But the answer is. Um, Many people, and it's, and it's interesting because we're talking not only about Asians now, but also Asian Americans. Many Asian Americans, I'm, I'm second generation, born in America, first language is English. In fact, I barely speak Chinese when you really come down to it. Um, no, I, no, really, um, and the answer is in this, right, definitely in second generation, I, I would argue in many cases into the third generation. So the answer is this self is quite persistent. And, um, 
But I mean, I think for educators to understand that is critical. Um, I will say also just, you know, I mean, because I'm in creative writing, I mean, I know that many, many creative writing teachers like um, the, um, the uh, flexi self does not like to talk about itself. You know, so the, the pit self is told from day one, tell me all about yourself, you know, and that's kind of, you know, your, your mother has been listening from day one and you're taught that's very important. Asians, it's like the opposite, you know, they do not like to talk about themselves. So what does the creative writing teacher do day one? Well, the creative writing teacher who gets in there and as a way of kind of putting all the students at ease says, when you write something about yourself day one, it's going to find that all the Asian and Asian Americans are going to leave the classroom. <laughs> in other words, they, can, they have to be aware that, you know, I mean, these, the, there are kids that are coming from very different cultural background. And if you say, please, write an essay about yourself, that could backfire big time. Unfortunately, mm. we've come to the end of our time. I want to encourage you to purchase these books. They are really, really, truly worth reading. I have read them both <laughs> to the surprise of our speaking. Please join me in thanking them very much for coming and speaking.